for our final conversation uh, for this block of the main stage, we are going to be working in partnership with EarthX. Um, if you're not familiar with EarthX, they are an international nonprofit dedicated to educating and inspiring people to take action to a more sustainable future worldwide. And I think after hearing Professor Eunice's comments this morning on the urgency of climate action, this conversation is very timely and even more important. Um, so with that, we are going to get right into this conversation around neotropical biodiversity. We've got a packed house. So I will turn it over to our moderator, Matt Foster, Director of Wildlands Priorities at the Global Wildlife Conservation and our panel. Matt, over to you. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our session on neotropical biodiversity, irreplaceable, threatened, and key to combating climate change. My name is Matt Foster, and as the Director for Wildlands Priorities at Global Wildlife Conservation, I work with our programs and partners to identify and prioritize sites for potential GWC investment. We are glad you are with us to discuss the incredible biodiversity of the tropical Americas. Our first panelist this afternoon is Dr. Russell Mittermeier. Russ was named a hero of the planet by Time Magazine and is regarded as a world leader in the field of biodiversity and tropical forest conservation. He has conducted field work in 30 countries with a particular focus on the neotropics in Amazonia. Russ currently serves as Chief Conservation Officer at Global Wildlife Conservation. Good afternoon, Russ. Good afternoon, Matt. First of all, Russ, what is the neotropical region, a term which some of our audience may not be familiar with, and why is it so important for uh, global biodiversity? Yeah, the neotropical region uh, pretty much corresponds to Latin America and the Caribbean, but uh, many of us in the biodiversity community prefer to use that term because it's one of the four, one of the eight major biogeographical regions in the world. And it means basically neotropical new world tropics, but it also includes not just uh, the tropical regions of uh, South and Central America, but also the temperate region, the entire South American continent, all of Central America, all of the Caribbean and the southernmost tropical uh, portions of, uh, of Mexico. And I always like to say that this region has a major competitive advantage in many ways in terms of living natural resources. It has by far the highest biodiversity of any major region. It's about 15% of the land surface of the planet, but it, depending on what group of organisms you look at, it can have as much as 50% of the total diversity of the planet. <clears throat> for plants, for example, it's about one third of all plants are found in this, uh, in this region. And it has the largest areas of uh, tropical rainforest. It has the uh, highest uh, freshwater uh, biodiversity, re freshwater resources. So it's a very, very special region. And compared to many of the other continents, it's still uh, more intact uh, compared to, let's say, Asia or mainland Africa. So in terms of, of conservation, it's critically important. And also in terms of, uh, of global climate change because of the tremendous importance of these, uh, these tropical forest systems. Excellent. Um, you have long advocated for a number of different priority setting mechanisms in dealing with biodiversity conservation globally, such as biodiversity hotspots, megadiversity countries, and high biodiversity wilderness areas. Um, would you care to elaborate on that a bit um, with speci special reference to the neotropical region? Sure. Well, again, the uh, just want to highlight how important the neotropical region is. The megadiversity country concept is a, a concept that I came up with in 1986, just to show that of the roughly 200 countries in the world, a small number are responsible for a major portion of the planet's biodiversity. There are 18 countries that uh, are responsible for about two thirds of all biodiversity, terrestrial, freshwater, and, uh, and marine. And as it happens, six of those, one third of them are found within the neotropical region. Brazil is a uh, competes with Indonesia for the title of richest country in the world. Uh, Colombia is an unquestioned third. And then you also have Peru, Ecuador, uh, Venezuela, and Mexico as, uh, as megadiversity countries. The US is also one, by the way, but not nearly as rich as the, uh, as the South, American, uh, South American countries. In terms of biodiversity hotspots, this is a concept that was first uh, developed by uh, British ecologist Norman Myers back in 1988. He recognized initially 10 biodiversity hotspots. And over the years, we've expanded that list 
to uh, come up with 36 biodiversity hotspots, which once occupied about 16% of the land surface of the planet, but with uh, all the losses that have taken place, they have lost roughly 90% of their original natural vegetation. So what remains in these is only about 2% uh, of the land surface of the planet. And yet within this 2%, you have at least 50% of all plant species and more than 40% of all um, animal species concentrated there as endemic. So again, tremendously important. And in the neotropical region, you have uh, Mesoamerica, the Caribbean, the Atlantic forest region of Brazil, the Sahado region of Brazil, and the tropical Andes as biodiversity hotspots, with the tropical Andes being the single richest of all of these 36 uh, hotspots. And if you want to talk about high biodiversity wilderness areas, there are three major uh, tropical forest regions in the world that have very high biodiversity, very high levels of endemism species that are found nowhere else. And they include the Amazon, Amazonia, uh, the Congo forests of Central Africa, and the island of New Guinea. And again, Amazonia is by far the largest of these high biodiversity wilderness areas. And still, in spite of all the problems that have taken place, they're still about 80% intact, although every year it tends to, uh, uh, more and more of it disappears with these terrible fires that are taking place. Great. Thank you, Russ. Our second panelist, Dr. Thomas Lovejoy, is an innovative conservation biologist and is the founder and president of the nonprofit Amazon Biodiversity Center and the renowned Biological Dynamics of Forest Fragments Project in Brazil. With three co-edited books on the subject, he's credited as a founder of the field of climate change biology. Welcome, Tom. Tom, you are created with coming up with the term biodiversity and have long been one of the leaders in making the linkages between biodiversity and climate change. Can you tell us more about this linkage and what you see taking place in the future? Yes, so thank you very much, Matt. I think the fundamental point is that climate change in the end is a biological problem. All the fossil fuels are ancient ecosystems which trapped solar energy through photosynthesis hundreds of millions of years ago. And now all of that is being released in an instant with the associated carbon to the atmosphere. But people are much less aware that a huge amount of terrestrial vegetation, terrestrial ecosystems have been destroyed and that carbon is in the atmosphere too. It's almost as much carbon in the atmosphere from destroyed terrestrial vegetation as remains in extant vegetation. And all species on earth are exquisitely tuned to relatively very precise conditions to live and climate change changes all of those. And we already, there's nowhere on the planet you look where you can't see the fingerprints of climate change uh, in nature. Uh, the good news uh, is that the only way we're going to end up with a safe landing at around one and a half degrees is if we actually get engaged very seriously in ecosystem restoration and bring a whole bunch of that carbon back from the atmosphere. And so looking at what somebody once called the biodiversity superpower, the neotropics, uh, that's an important part of how you get there. Uh, and it's also an important part of how you stabilize the Amazon and its hydrological cycle so that it doesn't flip into an alternate state of savanna vegetation. So most people think of climate change in physical terms. Uh, yes, it exerts itself in temperature increase, but it's basically biology in origin and in solution. Great, thank you, Tom. Our next panelist is Dr. Christopher Jordan, who is a researcher and conservationist specializing in biodiversity conservation, protected areas, indigenous peoples and conservation, and developing the capacity of local partners in the Americas. Chris is currently Central America and Tropical Andes Coordinator with Global Wildlife Conservation. Good afternoon, Chris. Thank you, Matt, um, and pleasure to be here. So I'm gonna be talking, oh, go ahead, do you? You've been a leader in promoting the importance of the five great forests in Mesoamerica. Could you tell us a little bit more about this and why they are so important? 
Sure. So within the neotropics, um, Mesoamerica um, can be a region that's a bit more overlooked compared to the Amazon, but it still retains some large, beautiful, important forests. Um, in particular, Mesoamerican's last five great forests are, are critical to the region's climate strategy, uh, including both adaptation and uh, mitigation. Uh, these forests, the five great forests, span from Colombia to Mexico and cover three times the area of Switzerland. Um, so specifically, they are the, the trinational Maya forest between Mexico, Belize, and Guatemala, the binational Mosquitia forest between Nicaragua and Honduras, the binational Indio Maiz Tortuguero forest between Costa Rica and Nicaragua, the Talamanca forest between Panama and Costa Rica, and the Darien between Panama and Colombia. So intact forests like these have been shown to hold over six times the carbon of more degraded forests. Um, and in fact, these five forests hold about half of the region's forest carbon stock. So half of the carbon stocks of Mesoamerica. They also provide essential ecosystem services to, to over 5 million people. Um, Mesoamerica's most vulnerable population to climate change, indigenous and local forest communities manage and protect around half of remaining forested areas in these forests. Um, and they depend on the resources of the five great forests for, for cultural identity, for food security, for income, and, and more. And on top of this, they're the remaining core areas for a host of endangered and threatened species, including Baird's tapirs, great green macaws, white-lipped peccaries, jaguars, etc. So since 2000, uh, three of these five great forests in Mesoamerica have been reduced by more than 23%, and 90% of the deforestation in them results from illegal cattle ranching. Um, much of this carried out within protected areas and indigenous territories by non-indigenous wealthy individuals, often as a front for organized crime and, and drug trafficking. Um, some cattle is connected to international export markets, including the United States, uh, and an estimated one to two million head of cattle are trafficked illegally as contraband to Mexico annually. Uh, cattle ranching is perhaps the most inefficient land use in tropical forests. Um, globally, livestock very conservatively pr produce about 14.5% of all greenhouse gas em emissions. 65% uh, of this total comes from cattle. I would say in the neotropics, animal agriculture is the leading cause of species extinction, um, ocean dead zones, water pollution, and, and habitat destruction. And as cattle ranching continues to spread across Mesoamerica, uh, climate change induced drought has, has sparked widespread forest fires, fires further exacerbating the, the climate crisis. So to, to, to sum up in uh, Mesoamerica, a resilient region requires the region's countries to work together to create a new model for development that, that values and protects intact forests and restores forests, that transforms agri-food systems to make them forest compatible uh, and more resilient to, to climate shocks and pandemics. Um, the the um, must focus on protecting these these five great forests in particular, these intact ecosystems, and maintaining the vital ecosystem services um, that help local communities to adapt to climate change. And importantly, we, we must across the region engage indigenous forest-based cultures and support local food systems to reinforce secure tenure and promote traditional knowledge. Great, thank you, Chris. Our final panelist is Dr. Lena Valencia who serves as the Columbia Conservation Officer at Global Wildlife Conservation, developing partnerships with local organizations and governments in Colombia and the tropical Andes more broadly. Lena is originally from Colombia and completed her PhD at the University of Texas at Austin, focused on understanding how to promote landscape connectivity for endangered primates in human modified landscapes. Hi, Lena. Hi, Matt. Pleasure Lena, to be here. Lena, your country, Colombia, is the third largest country on Earth for biodiversity, exceeded only by Brazil and Indonesia. What makes Colombia so biodiverse? And considering that Colombia has a long history of conservation achievement, can you tell us more about what Colombia has done? Yeah, and and I I want to start by like putting a little bit of reference. If you think about Colombia, Colombia is less than twice the size of Texas, and it has around fifty six species of flora and fauna, of which a fifth are only found in the country. So when you think about those numbers, Colombia has the highest number of species per area. And if you randomly pick one species in a piece of land, chances are one out of ten that it that species is only found in the country, and that's eye-opening and marvelous to, to know. And what has caused this um, great richness in biodiversity is the fact that the Andes, when they arrived to Colombia, they split in three different mountain chains, mountain ranges that are divided by deep valleys, inter-Indian valleys, and they create islands of endemism where a lot of biodiversity has been able to occur. 
And going to your second question, uh, what has Colombia has been one of the countries with one of the most progressive policies towards um, protection of this biodiversity as well as the guardians or the communities that are living hand in hand with this um, biodiversity. And one of those or two of those that I wanna talk about today is one first, the creation of a network of protected areas. So public protected areas cover around 10% of the country. And throughout the history, uh, you know, in the last two to three decades, the government has really worked in expanding and creating a connected network of protected areas. And in the last two years, it uh, created in partnership with private and public entities, a financial mechanism, sustainable mechanism to ensure the management as well as expansion of those protected areas. And when you look about that, one of the other things that I like to mention about Colombia is that, again, we have in the region one of the most progressive policies towards the protection of indigenous people. And this is Amerindians and Afro-descent communities' rights uh, to manage autonomously their territories. So in the constitution back in 1991, uh, the government started a process to title the traditional territories of both Afro-descent and indigenous communities allowing them to have collective rights to their territories equivalent to a local municipality. And this allowed them to protect the traditional uh, practices and management of, uh, of the territories that these indigenous communities have, as well as ensuring the protection of their political autonomy and culture. And when you, again, translate this in numbers, when you think about it, indigenous communities in Colombia represent less than 20% of the population yet they hold around 25 percent of national territories but the most eye-opening figure is that of those 20 percent 80 percent is the forest that remains in the country so when you think about it these policies had allowed the indigenous communities and afro descent um, communities mostly in the pacific as well as in the amazon but also in the tropical andes to manage their territory in a sustainable way ensuring their traditional livelihoods, protecting their culture, and hand in hand, ensuring that these forests are standing. And, and I think those two key things are what has ensured that Colombia is the third country with the highest level of biodiversity and, and still is protected, despite the fact that we are facing new, numerous threats every day. That's great, thank you, Lena. Um, I'd now like to ask an open question to the panel, but um, I'll begin with, with Russ, um, if you can answer first. Russ, what would you consider to be the most important thing or one of the most important things that viewers could do to make a difference for biodiversity, conservation, and for climate change? Well, first of all, uh, in the United States in particular, we have to recognize that climate change is real. And with the change in government that's now taking place, will take, take effect as of uh, January 20th, we really hope that the U.S. will again enter the global community uh, as uh, constituted in the Paris Agreement uh, five years ago and really become a very active player in global climate change. What we also need to do is recognize that biodiversity conservation and climate change are very, very much interconnected and that uh, at least 30 percent of the solution to climate change uh, is based in tropical forest conservation and restoration and that is the most cost effective the least expensive way we can tackle this issue and at the same time uh, bring about a great degree of uh, biodiversity protection across the world if we really recognize the interconnectedness of these two issues great um, would anyone else on the panel like to comment on uh, on what might be uh, something that viewers could do to make a difference for biodiversity and climate change? Um, Tom, perhaps? Yeah, well, let me just jump in and say, you know, um, when you recognize that biodiversity and ecosystems are totally intertwined with climate change uh, and that restoration is an important part of addressing the challenge, uh, the part you can't leave out because the numbers don't add up otherwise. It takes this from being something that is a great big problem, what can I possibly do, to something where individuals can make a difference. Helping plant a tree in a forest restoration project, helping shovel mud and restore a coastal wetland project. So suddenly, instead of being this enormous thing, you know, what can I do? 
find ways to embrace nature and you will protect biodiversity and help climate change at the same time. Excellent. Uh, Chris? Um, for everyone to, to contribute to biodiversity, I think it's important to think about um, our diets and consumption, uh, which is a tricky issue. Um, but right now, about 27% of the land on the planet is used um, uh, solely for feeding and raising livestock. Um, so a transition away from, from animal agriculture, including in our personal diets, but perhaps more important, getting behind deforestation-free procurement policies so that we know that what we're buying at the supermarket is not um, contributing to this problem is something that's very important. And like Russ mentioned with the new administration, I, I hope that there are opportunities for uh, the United States to, to push for this um, and push to make sure that they are, are, are the products that we're buying uh, are not causing deforestation. I hope that the government is able to get behind this and that the population um, pressures the government to, to get there. Excellent. And Lena, would you like to add any final words on the subject? Yeah, just adding to those that let's not forget that individual choices help to mitigate climate change. This is a big monster, but our everyday decisions can support, can help do that. And as Tom was saying, it could go from planting a tree to shoveling here to what Chris was saying, being very cautious of your dietary choices and how you consume and what, where, what you consume, where does it come from? And we can all do changes on an everyday life that is gonna have impacts to reduce climate change effects. Great. Well, Russ, Tom, Chris, Lena, thank you so much for joining this panel on Neotropical Biodiversity and Climate Change. And thank you to Concordia for the opportunity to showcase such an important issue.